All right, let's just begin with the intro and then people can uh, log in when they can. Welcome everyone to today's session and chat with Dr. Brian DeGrazia, Associate Director of Programs and Career Services Coordinator at the Modern Language Association. Thank you, Brian, for telling us a little bit about your transition story today. Um, these storytelling sessions are really helpful for us to hear what career paths are available to PhDs, but also very intriguing to listen to the decision-making um, process and strategy involved. So Brian, by the way, the reason I reached out to you on LinkedIn and hint, hint people, I reached out to Brian on LinkedIn and found him there is um, a student actually suggested that I invite the, someone from MLA. So that's the reason. So thank you, anonymous student who sent the feedback and guiding me about um, sort of what I would need to do to address your needs. So keep educating me and communicating as well. Speaking of communicating, um, if you have any questions, drop your questions in the chat box. Um, we'll ask Brian all these uh, questions that we have for him at the end of his talk portion. So feel free to fill the chat box with questions that we've done before. And that's all I have to say. Uh, welcome. And thank you, Brian, for doing this. And um, this is all you now. And you can hear me OK? Well, thank you, Rajni, for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all virtually today. Um, and thank you. Uh, I'd like to echo Rajni's thanks to the anonymous student who um, suggested that uh, that Futures invite somebody from the MLA because, as Rajni mentioned, I'm happy to tell you a little bit about my story today. Um, but the MLA also does quite a bit of work, uh, has done and is continuing to do um, quite a bit of work on career preparation for graduate students in the humanities, um, as well as helping departments and faculty members support that preparation. So I'll talk a little bit about myself, and then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the work that the MLA is doing. Um, and so to begin, uh, for those of you who are wondering about a job search and when your career is going to start, uh, and maybe this notion that, that your career starts once your PhD is finished, and you get that next job, um, I think it's important to remember that your career has actually already started um, for the very basic reason that time spent in a PhD program is work. Um, so there, there are many kinds of work that you're all doing right now. Um, I'm sure you could name a few just off the top of your heads. Um, and it's true that you know, you're quote in school and, and it's true that you're getting some really significant training, um, but it's also true that you're already a professional, whether whether you started your PhD just after your undergraduate career or um, you worked in the industry uh, for 10 or 15 years or somewhere in the middle, um, a PhD program is work. And so a lot of what I'll say today has to do um, with that idea. So, so keep in mind that when you get overwhelmed and, and you're thinking about starting your job search, remember that your career is already underway. Uh, it's important to to think of your full self, um, and I'm glad that Rajni, um, you invited you invited me, gave me the opportunity to talk a bit about myself. And you mentioned just now um, the decision making process. I, I think what can inform that uh, is to think not only about um, the tenure track and and maybe another kind of job, but but to really think about what it is that gets you up in the morning and what you want. Um, your professional, but also just your life more broadly to look like. So again, thinking about the kinds of work that you want to do, um, and that that can be along the lines of uh, an industry uh, or a sector that you're interested in, um, but also the kind of everyday task. Are you a better dependent worker? Are you a better team worker? Uh, what kinds of things do you like to spend your time doing? Do you want to continue to write? Are you a better public speaker? Um, thinking about the things that matter to you, um, so the things that you really value, and again, those can be in a professional context, but also, you know, in your personal life, what are your commitments um, to certain communities or causes, and, and, and are those things that, that you want to have a voice in, in the work that you pursue? Life to look like, you know, I think that, um, I think that being in PhD programs even if we're interested from the start in a variety of careers, uh, we can get the idea uh, that the first thing we should be pursuing is the tenure track and 
a lot of us are used to the idea of, um, well, there are only going to be a certain number of jobs in my field this year, and I'm going to have to pick up and move um, wherever I get one. I sort of have to be open to that. And I just want to say, I, hopefully you've heard this before, but in case this is the first time, and it can't hurt to reiterate, um, you don't have to do that. Uh, you know, your, your, your list of criteria um, for choosing a job can say, okay, I'd like this kind of tenure track job and I'm willing to make these sacrifices to do it. Um, and tenure track job at a certain kind of school can be that first criterion, but the first criterion can also be, um, I live in Baltimore and I wanna stay here or my family is back in Texas or California or, or Idaho and, and I'd like to find a job back there, whether it's geography or um, if you'd like a job with a certain kind of structure, if you'd like a job that allows you a lot of freedom um, in terms of making your own schedule. Um, your job search should, um, should reflect your own values and the kinds of things that you want and not what, other, what you think others might expect of you or what, what they've told you uh, they expect. Keeping in mind this variety of factors, I, I think is what can process that, that Rajni referred to. Um, and so a tool that you may have heard of uh, is this individual um, development planning tool called Imagine PhD, which was developed, as you can see, is in the humanities and social sciences. Um, I think it strikes a real balance um, of getting you the kinds of things that you want to do. Um, just gonna pause my video because it seems we're having some connection issues. Okay, thanks Rajni. Um, so a lot of conversations, a lot of graduate students, um, I've heard say, um, you know, what, what are the, what are the kinds of things that I can do with my PhD? What are the kinds of careers that I can pursue, uh, after I finish my degree? And, and it's important to think about the ways in which you might translate your skills, um, and the kinds of things that are possible and, and the other paths that, that others have taken, but equally as important again, as I was just saying, are the kinds of things that you want. Um, so as much as you're thinking about translating your skills and the kinds of work that you think might be, the kinds of jobs that might be available to you, the kinds of work you think you might be good at based on past experiences, it's also equally important um, to think about what it is that you really want uh, and, and, and to be thinking about that alongside the more practical question of, of translating skills and what you can do. Um, and so you'll, you'll see the link uh, here to Imagine PhD. Um, it's a really excellent resource. It's totally free, uh, developed by folks who are experts in the field of graduate career exploration um, and funded by a consortium of universities. And so they're not going to sell your data or anything like that. Um, and so this can be a really wonderful starting place. I'd, I'd recommend spending some real time with it. Um, it can be a bit of work, but I think it, it, it can produce a lot of really helpful results, um, especially if you're just starting out thinking about this stuff. Um, and so as much as doing that individual exploration work uh, is important, I think it's also great to start conversations uh, or join those that are already happening. Uh, a great place to do this is on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I know that uh, Futures and Rajni have offered a series of professional development events. I'm sure you've, you've heard at least a little bit about LinkedIn uh, and how to use it more actively, but I think even just passively paying attention and following folks on LinkedIn and Twitter and getting a sense of the kinds of spaces, um, professional spaces that you might be interested in and the kinds of conversations that are going on, um, as well as following individual people who you know have done things that interest you can be super useful. Uh, it can be good to have a conversation with your advisor and or your director of graduate studies. I know that um, this is sometimes touchier for folks who think or know that um, professors in their departments are not all that supportive or open to having conversations like this. And so this might not be available to you, um, but it might be worth doing some homework and at least trying to feel it out because um, sometimes faculty can offer 
um, at least a few ideas, if not a really engaging conversation. Uh, finding another professional mentor can be great. Um, this can be through a work context, through networking. It can also be someone from, from your broader network that you've already developed uh, who works in a field that's different than, than higher education or different than your direct um, academic area of specialty um, to whom you start asking professional questions and, and for professional advice. Um, it can just be good to cultivate those relationships uh, and start to get some career advice from people who have a different take on things. Um, peers, I think, can be a really excellent resource. Again, thinking back to Rajni's mention of um, the decision-making process, I was involved, and I can talk a bit more about this, uh, before joining the MLA staff, uh, and I've been there for about a year and a half. Um, but before joining staff, I was on, um, I was part of a, a professional development training program uh, for graduate students that the MLA ran. Uh, with a cohort of 20 other graduate students or recent PhDs. Um, and I think there was a, a lot of the pressure was taken off because it was people who weren't at, in my department, uh, in my field, or at my institution. Um, and so getting to have those really nitty gritty conversations with people who likely share a lot in the way of interests and values um, and are, are also sharing a lot in terms of the challenges and the concerns that they have for the future and for their careers. Um, it's when you get into those really nitty gritty conversations. I think some really interesting things can come out. Uh, and more specifically, I'll give one example. Um, there were some really excellent teachers that I became very close friends with, folks who just had invested a lot and done a lot of um, pedagogy training programs and done a lot to reform the ways in which certain classes in their department were taught to undergraduates. Um, and that, those conversations were really helpful um, in making me myself realize okay, I love working with students, I love being in higher education, I don't have the same passion that these people have um, for being in the classroom uh, and for being in front of a group of 15 or 25 or 200 students. Um, I like thinking um, I like where I feel like my skills are being, being used best. Um, and so those kinds of conversations, I think, is where you start to split hairs um, and some of those more nuanced uh, observations can, can surface. And so as much as it can be helpful to have people with similar experiences and backgrounds uh, involved in these conversations, um, I think it can also be really good uh, to have somebody who's really close to you, who knows you super well on a personal level, um, but who isn't, uh, who isn't in your field, who doesn't work in your field. I think of, um, I did my PhD at NYU and the fellowship application for, for dissertation finishing fellowships encouraged us, and this may be the case too for you, but encouraged us to think of a New York Times reader, right? So someone who, uh, who's educated and well-read enough to sort of understand the broader argument of your project, uh, but doesn't really know, understand the nitty gritty of what your dissertation talks about. Um, so someone who's a couple steps removed from exactly what it is that you're doing every day, I think you having to get out of the weeds and explain to them in broader terms what it is that you've done as part of your PhD um, and what it means to you can be a really helpful perspective. To think in silos. Um, we're often encouraged to think of our research, our teaching, and our service. Um, those are often the headers of, of different sections on our academic CVs. Um, but I think it's really important to think about what motivates your work uh, when you get up in the morning and the different ways in which the different things you do are connected. Um, and I'll just share an anecdote about this. Uh, my loved one with whom I have this conversation happens to be uh, a professional resume writer and it's, uh, she's my cousin, but she's also a professional resume writer. And you don't necessarily need someone who's a professional resume writer to have these conversations. Um, but what we did was uh, I printed out my academic CV and we sat down together and we just sort of went line by line looking at the different things. And she asked me about the different papers I'd given at conferences and the different courses I'd taught and the different initiatives I'd been involved in in terms of service. Um, 
and really, I mean, this was hours and hours of work, but really started to pull all the details out of me um, to get a sense of what I was doing. And uh, again, because she's not, because she's not in the weeds on the kinds of the kinds of research I was doing. My research, uh, my dissertation was about HIV AIDS in the Italian media. Um, and so parts of it talked about uh, LGBTQ activism uh, and community organizing. Uh, so she heard me say that when I gave the spiel about my dissertation. And then she saw on my CV that some of my service work um, had, as part of my service work, I had done some mentoring for some LGBTQ undergraduate student organizations at NYU. Uh, and she just sort of made the observation, you know, these two seem connected. It seems like you have commitments um, to this community. Uh, is that something that you want to explore more? And it may sound crazy to you, that that, that may sound pretty obvious, and, and it may sound um, a little wild that I hadn't made that connection, but I really hadn't. Um, again, I think because we have a lot of unlearning to do in terms of what PhD programs can encourage us to, to think of ourselves in these silos, to think of these different hats that we wear um, and that they're often presented as, as separate, whereas really we're always just ourselves and everything is connected. Um, and so it wasn't until this conversation with my cousin that I realized, oh right, th this is something of course that, that means a lot to me. And of course it's something in my personal life, it's part of my research, it's part of the service that I do. Um, and when I say train out of us, it's funny because when that example surfaced, she said, wow, it's, it's so funny you haven't thought about that. Um, why don't you go back to any documents you have in which you're, you were presenting yourself professionally uh, and see the narratives that you presented. So I went back to all the essays that I'd written for uh, admission to PhD programs. And one of the programs to which I'd applied asked for the sort of more standard research statement. And then another one that linked research to a more personal take. I'd written about these very issues. I'd written about my interest in, in queer theory and LGBT history and culture and the ways it was connected to the work, uh, to the community and organizing work that I'd done uh, and how I wanted to explore that as part of the PhD program. So, you know, six years earlier, I'd actually written these things about myself and then just gotten used to, during my program, thinking in certain ways. Uh, yes, to connecting the dots, exactly. Uh, and so at least th this is what worked for me was having this conversation with someone who's known me my whole life and uh, and could really help me connect these dots in different ways. And I'll come back to why that's important. Um, for now, I will just share that uh, it was a lot of work, like I said, but it was also incredibly rewarding, uh, rewarding and empowering. Uh, this was when I was really just embarking on my search during my last year of graduate school. Uh, and it really made me feel like I had, it really made me feel like I could um, better articulate the longstanding commitments that I had and the work that I've been doing. And again, the ways in which all these dots were connected. Uh, so on this note, part of this exercise that I did my, with my cousin, um, you know, we, we put things under service and so we think of them as service, uh, but that's work. Um, that can be work. Uh, and and I, I hear from a lot of folks, um, oh, you know, I'm interested in digital humanities. Should I do this training course or should I get training in the library sciences or um, take an Excel course or all these kinds of different professional development, discrete professional development things that we can do. And those can I think we lost Brian, everyone. Brian, we can't hear you. Um, I think we lost you. Did you switch over to that other internet you were talking about? Sorry, everyone. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> uh, we, I think we lost you about a minute ago. Okay. Okay, so if we wanna go back to that um, slide again and then 
Sure. Do you remember the last thing I said? Was it about connecting the dots? Uh, a little after that. Who remembers the exact sentence? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Still want to repeat myself too much. Go ahead and um, sh uh, share your slides again and we'll, we'll know. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't realize that had disconnected. Yes, the internet. So Rachel reminds us that you were talking about uh, training courses for professional development. Okay. Um, and so those can be really useful, but I think it's important first to, to realize what it is that you've already done um, and the skills that you already do have. Um, and before embarking on building more skills for yourself um, to do some of this work around what are the kinds of things that I'm interested in and then to make the decision if you want to do those kinds of courses, um, that'll give you a better sense of, of what, it, what it is that might be helpful. Um, I've done these assessments. I realize these are the fields that might be the best fits for me. And so I'm going to try to develop more specifically skills or experiences in that area. Um, for making this, I think this is useful for making those kinds of decisions. Um, but again, in terms of the broader decision-making process to which Rajni referred to at the start. Um, some of my most meaningful work experiences uh, during graduate school that had to do with my decision to apply for and eventually take this role at the MLA were unpaid. Um, and I'm thinking most specifically of the work that I did uh, with my graduate student union. You know, I, um, this of course was unpaid and, and, and was beyond the curriculum or anything I was doing to finish my degree. Um, but I made really meaningful connections with other people and I realized all the ways in which I care about graduate education more broadly and the conditions under which students are, are pursuing um, their degrees and, and all the things that go into the experience of a PhD program. Um, and so it wasn't really until I thought meaningfully about these experiences in the union that I realized, oh, okay, it's not a community organizing job at the MLA but I will get to think about these broader issues of graduate education and hopefully get to make some change. Um, so again, I think going line by line and really teasing out what different experiences were and what they meant for you um, can be really useful. And again, this helps at, at the broader level of, of making decisions and thinking about the kinds of um, industries and, and roles that might be a good fit for you. Um, but I think they also, I, I think thinking in this way, and again, having a conversation with someone gets you used to talking about these experiences so that when you need to tell a story in a cover letter or an interview, hopefully as, as things progress, um, you'll be able to pull these out. Uh, and, and I mean, they might jump out at folks from, from the resume that you submit, um, or if they ask you more broadly, um, you, can, you can take out one of these anecdotes and, and share it. Uh, in terms of what's possible, uh, this is a very broad list and I realize it's super text heavy. Uh, it's sort of meant to overwhelm you, I guess, just, uh, just to give you a sense of the very um, broad range of things that humanities PhDs find themselves doing after their programs. Um, as I say at the bottom, I, I borrow this from my colleague, Laura Lee Stark, uh, who does career advising at Harvard. Um, it's very broad. I'm happy to, to talk more about this. Um, but I guess I just wanted to make the point that when we talk about careers for people in the humanities, um, we can think about that in two ways. Do you, do you want the humanities to continue to, to play a significant role in your everyday professional life? Do you want to work at an organization that's engaging directly with the humanities? Um, or are you thinking more about the ways in which you might apply your humanistic skills across a variety of industries. And so that latter bit, I think is what, is what this slide gets at all the ways in which maybe institutions that don't, um, that don't necessarily work directly in the humanities, um, but where your skills would be, would be very valued and useful um, is what this list is. If you're more interested in thinking about staying in the humanities, quote unquote, um, oh no. I seem my diagram is not popping up. Um, okay, I had a graphic there. I'm not sure you can't see that graphic, can you? Okay, I'm not sure 
where that's gone. Um, but um, maybe during the q and I'll, 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 I'll pull it up. Um, but we can think about the broader humanities ecosystem uh, is, is what that slide gets at. And I can share a document with everyone afterwards. You can spend some time taking a look at it. Um, but, uh, you know, the humanities, especially in PhD programs, we often think of the humanities existing just in um, university humanities departments. Uh, but the truth is that, that it, it goes well beyond that, of course, as many of you probably well know. Within the university, uh, there are humanities centers. Um, there are scholarly associations like the MLA and the AHA uh, that support the work of humanities at individual universities. Um, and then there's a broader set of, of different workplaces and industries that either support that work in higher ed or um, support the humanities more broadly. There's the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, at the federal level, which supports each of the 50 state humanities councils and the work that they do in humanities programming for the public in each state. Um, there are think tanks, uh, there are foundations um, that fund a lot of this work uh i see a question from the audience is there is there a way to still pursue a love of teaching and mentoring from outside the academy um yes i think i think that there are many ways to do this um i think um first of all uh one of the pieces of advice that we give to um to departments is to, to track their alumni and to stay in touch with folks after they leave programs. And so I think whatever you end up doing, hopefully your department will be keen to stay in touch uh, and, and have, you, um, have you involved in, and have you get in touch with current students who are thinking about pursuing a wide range of careers. Um, and you can offer some mentorship in a professional capacity in that way. Um, I think it's also important to remember that, that teaching, uh, does not have to look like one person standing at the front of a classroom. Um, and, and mentorship doesn't need to look like uh, office hours or, um, you know, a monthly coffee with, with, the, um, with the student in your program who's two or three years behind you, who's just starting out in coursework and you're, you know, finishing your dissertation. Um, I think this is where uh, career exploration tools and conversations with folks like me and, and Roshni and Justin and others. Um, yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, I think that um, I think this is part of how I ended up in a sort of career services role, even though I don't always work directly with students uh, and I'm not at an individual university. Um, I like individual teaching and mentorship um, more than I find myself at ease in front of a classroom. And so I think to think beyond, you know, you might not be teaching um, Virginia Woolf or Toni Morrison the way that you're used to right now. Um, but there are plenty of ways to still engage with the humanities and to still engage with teaching and mentorship. Um, I think another question that I, um, that comes up a lot is um, fulfilling roles in higher education that are not necessarily on the tenure track, and this can be a great way to do it. Um, you know, as Roshni is saying, um, she feels like she teaches in career services, but this is also a great way to stay at a university. You know, I think those of us who choose to do a PhD um, there's probably something about being in the university environment that we like, that we want to give back to. Um, and so, you know, I think right in front of you, Justin and Roshan, you're two wonderful examples of people who have pursued PhDs and found really fulfilling work supporting students in different ways. Um, and so I think um, when we think about looking for models and, and looking for the different kinds of careers that people with PhDs different pathways that they've pursued. I think it's one of the best ways to do that is just to sort of look around your university um, and see who's in administration, see who's in career services, see who's in the graduate school or the dean's office. Um, because they're at your institution, it, it's sort of um, low hanging fruit. It's maybe a little bit less intimidating to email someone, but you can just say, hey, I'm a graduate student in, um, in English or history and I'd love to talk to you about, um, I'd love to get coffee and talk to you about um, how you ended up in your current role, I think is, is a great start to informational interviews um, and can give you a sense of the broad range of things that you can do even still from within a university. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry this, this graphic has mysteriously disappeared from my slides on the humanities um, ecosystem. 
Um, but there's a broad range of jobs within, as I'm saying, the university, but also beyond it, that still engage directly uh, with the humanities. And so um, it's important to keep in mind. Uh, and again, I think a lot of the career exploration work will help you get a sense of what are the different kinds of, of things that are available to me based on my skills, but also I'd really like to stay in higher ed or I'd really like to stay involved with the humanities on a daily basis. Um, there's definitely a broad range of careers available to you. Um, I seem to be having trouble with a lot of the images that were supposed to be on these slides. Um, I wanted to show you um, a few images from my cover letter and my resume that I used to apply for this job. Um, but maybe what we can do is take a couple questions and then I can um, see what's going on and see if I can get it remedied and then we can go back to those um, and I can share those images if that sounds okay. Yeah, and, and Brian, I, when you switched over, uh, we had that when you logged off, your internet seems to be doing much better. So if you dare, you can turn your video on and if it stalls again, you can turn your video off again. For the okay. Process. Okay, so I'm gonna start this. Hello again. There you are. And I'll stop sharing and yeah, if there are questions. Um... Okay, yes. So Justin has said that a lot of PhDs in life design labs, he's, he was speaking to your point about being career services, working with students, helping that a lot of PhDs who work in uh, university administration. Justin's put the, uh, a note in the chat. I do have a question from the audience that was submitted while registering. So uh, someone asks you, what was the easiest and hardest part about leaving academia? Um, well, I work at a scholarly association that um, largely, and especially in my role, supports uh, faculty members and graduate students uh, at universities around the country. Um, so I can't fully say that I've left academia um, because I'm about as close as you can get, I guess, without, um, without being on a university campus. Um, I suppose the harder things, I mean, to be quite frank, uh, it's been an adjustment not to have full flexibility during the summer. Um, that is something that I miss. Um, I'm an Italianist by training, and so having some of that direct contact with the people um, who I worked with and the things I was studying and not knowing when I'll get to go back to, um, to see some of those people and, and to be in some of those archives uh, has been a little bit challenging. Um, but there's also, um, there's also, I have a lot of satisfaction in the decision that I made. And I think getting to some of the points um, that I was making earlier, uh, it was hard to give up the flexibility in, in the summers and even during the academic year, um, the relative flexibility. But I realized thinking really hard about the six years that I spent in the PhD program, that that kind of lack of structure wasn't necessarily the healthiest thing for me. Um, and there is something, even though it's taken quite a bit of adjustment, there is something about a nine to five and the structure of it um, that really helps me and that's really rewarding and that really helps me to um, keep work and the rest of my life separated. Um, and, and I think the other thing that I like, again, I, I like thinking about, uh, as I said, in terms of my experience in the union, I like thinking about problems and I like thinking about structures and so I feel really lucky to have gotten a job at a national organization that allows me to see things um, from one more step backed up and then to, to see what's going on at different institutions and to be considering things um, at a more systemic level. Um, so that's what I would say. I guess the other thing I would say and I'm sure you'll hear this from, from Rajni and Justin too, uh, is that you know I only graduated 15 months ago and uh, and who knows what will be what will be next in my career? Um, I think more and more, um, especially for folks who stay sort of adjacent to to tenure track jobs or to the academy, um, making your way back in is um, 
is seemingly more possible. You may be familiar with the ACLS Public Fellows Program, um, which I think is excellent. It, it should be on your radar uh, for, for job prospects. I also think it's a wonderful archive just in terms of the, the possibilities for humanities and social sciences PhDs and what's available to you. And just to get a sense of those job descriptions and those kinds of institutions. Um, but the folks at ACLS recently shared that program is 10 years in. And I think about 11% of folks who have done these two year fellowships, these two year jobs outside the academy have actually after that gone back and gotten tenure track jobs. Um, and that's not to say that, that the tenure track necessarily has to be the goal for everyone. For, for a lot of folks, it isn't. It, it wasn't necessarily ever for me. Um, but it seems that departments are more and more open to seeing an experience that's different from a teaching postdoc um, or a lectureship or a visiting assistant professorship and saying, this person has gone off and done this different thing. Uh, and that's an experience that we value and we're going to hire them back into our department. So I think that things are, I don't want to get carried away, but I think things are, are slowly becoming more fluid. And Brian, you'd mentioned sitting with your cousin, you know, going line by line on your academic CV and trying to, trying to you know, make what sounded like you were trying to figure out what an uh, you know, alt resume would look like as well in that process. So someone's question was, in what ways can PhD students frame their doctoral work as relevant preparation for other fields? So basically, can you walk us through a little bit about how you sat down and translated that academic CV into really extracting all the qualities you would need for applying to the, your current position? Sure. Um, and so this is what I wanted to do uh, with those images that wouldn't show up, but I'm going to try something different. Um, share that. Can you see my CV? Okay. So summary of core strengths would be, um, you might also see this as an executive summary. Um, I think doing those different exercises that I mentioned to really figure out what your narrative is and where it is that you're coming from is the essential work that goes into being able to put together three punchy bullet points in this way. Um, I think the other thing to get used to is uh, you're telling your story, but don't feel bad or grimy about telling different stories and presenting different versions of yourself for different roles. Um, you know, in the same way that you're going to send a different um, set of materials to a research focused university than you would to a community college or to a small liberal arts college. Um, you're going to tell different stories and things are going to look slightly different for the, for the different kinds of roles to which you're applying. And so I think to tell different versions of your story and to, and to highlight different specifics as they relate to different roles is only a, a smart thing to do. And I wouldn't feel sort of funny or dishonest about that. It's, you should feel excited that, that there are many exciting versions of yourself that you can present to a variety of different roles. Um, and so this document is, as you can see, a sort of hybrid between a CV and a resume. Um, the MLA did say they would take a CV or a resume. Um, and again, because my job is so heavily academic adjacent and my supervisor was a faculty member for many years before he joined the MLA, um, this document looks like something in between a CV and a resume. Um, what I will say that that worked specifically to the point of the work that I did with my cousin um, and to what I said at the beginning that you're in a PhD program and that's work. What does that work look like? Um, and thinking about telling these different versions of your story. I think What can be most useful about that work is identifying discrete experiences and explaining them out. Okay, well, I, I've taught for four years. Okay, well, what does that mean. What do you actually do. Um, and so here's my teaching section, right? And I think quantifying whenever possible can be really useful, um, but to break out those, those discrete experiences and not just say, oh, I was a PhD student for six years. Well, luckily enough for me, people at the MLA know what that means. Folks at lots of other places won't. Um, and so rather than just saying, this is the role that I had, thinking about the discrete kinds of tasks and things that you carried out and describing all those different kinds of work um is is part of the process of translating um 
a CV into a resume and part of translating your experience to roles beyond the academy. Um, and again, this is farther down and I have it as service because this is a sort of hybrid document. Um, but I put my union work on here um, because the job ad that, to which I applied specifically mentions the adjunct crisis um, and what to do about that um, from a labor perspective. And those are things that I had thought about a fair amount with the union and so it, it was relevant um, and so I put it here. Ryan, uh, a question from uh, Nathan is from what you've seen and this actually you and Justin can both answer this because you've both sort of done similar things is do you um, from what you've seen do those who leave academia tend to start in entry level positions or are many PhDs able to find success in higher level positions without direct technical training? Justin, did you want to in or? Huh? Sure. I think it really depends. You know, I think there are some jobs and career fields where that easily recognizes the work that you did in a PhD program as being, you know, as, as counting or sort of being helpful in the career and, you know, having the PhD is valuable. So you come in at a slightly higher level than you, than you would. Um, having just, you know, not having a PhD. I think one of the tricky things to keep in mind is that um, outside of the professorship, a lot of positions to sort of take that next step oftentimes requires supervisory experience. So sometimes you might be looking at a position where you have the skill set, you have, you know, the training, like it seems like it's good, but if you're managing people, it's very hard to go from you know, being a, a, a doctoral student to then jumping into a management position. That's one thing where I think it's a tough jump, but it's also, but I have seen people go and go into sort of a director level position or associate level director position that really, that really recognizes their work. It's not entry level. They might have broader oversight over projects and not necessarily teams, um, but it depends. I would not, I would never tell someone not to apply for a job because they don't feel like they have enough experience. You know, counting your doctoral experience as three to five years of experience, you know, for oftentimes will allow you to apply for those that next step up kind of job. Yeah, which is what Brian was saying is you are already doing the work. You are already began your career. So how do you translate what you're doing as a graduate student and utilize that sort of skills or transferable or relational skills into demonstrating that you can do the job that you're applying for? Brian. Yeah. Um, I did want to address this question that came from two to three people is, do you have any specific advice for international students applying for uh, humanities positions in Altac? Um, I'll be frank, I, I don't. Um, I know that it's, it's challenging. A lot of non, most nonprofits, I think, are not usually willing to sponsor visas. Um, and you know, I mentioned the ACLS Public Fellows Program. I know that that's only open to those who are already um, legally able to work in um, in the U.S. Um, I have some experience in private industry myself. Um, I worked in investment banking after I finished my um, my undergraduate degree, and I worked with a lot of folks from different places. And um, my firm sponsored their visas. But at least anecdotally, what I've heard is that um, you know no one is a stranger to the fact that it's a, it's a complicated time uh, for for non for non citizens in this country and that that landscape even in private industry um, has changed and so um, I think this is where again informational interviews and reaching out to folks who have had similar experience can be really helpful um, I would hope that a lot of the um, sort of self presentation and professional development work would help for folks would help people who are who are still looking for jobs even outside the country i know that job markets look different in different places but i think a lot of this work still translates to that but in terms of looking specifically in the united states um i know that it's that, that, it, that it's a really challenging time and i don't want to make that seem rosier than it is yeah and it really depends on the sector for example if you're going to government if you're interested in government then it's obviously very very limited options but private industry definitely there are options like consulting people are willing to sponsor if you're the right candidate so the important thing is you have to present yourself to be the right person for the job then people are willing to um, sponsor as well 
So question here is, did you have reservations about working in administration before taking on your current role? Sure. Um, if I could just add one last thing to that prior question. Mm -hmm. um, what I will say is um, nothing official yet from the MLA, but I'm doing some work to work on a statement and do some organizing around encouraging universities to sponsor visas for, for international folks the way that they do for junior faculty members, because in my mind, and I know lots of others, um, and Rashni and Justin are perfect examples, um, you know, a PhD is required for an assistant professorship in, in Chinese or history. It maybe wasn't required for Justin or Rajni's role, but they contribute to the professional and intellectual life of Hopkins as much as a junior faculty member. And so I know it's a delicate conversation and universities find themselves in a challenging moment too. But if anyone wants to engage further uh, in this conversation, Rosny and Justin in particular, if you'd like, um, you know, thinking about the different ways all of you can contribute to a university, whether you're in career services or the Dean's office, or you're in an academic department in a classroom, I think our contributions need to be valued equally. So um, if anybody wants to keep talking about that, let's. Um, the other question was around if I have, um, if I had reservations about working in administration. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't. Um, like I said, I, I, there are parts of my research that I miss. I realized that the classroom is maybe not where I'm fully at my best. Um, I like mentorship roles. I like, um, I like teamwork. Um, I like networking. I love talking to people. I love doing stuff like this and that's a lot of my job. Um, and so I was actually excited for, for a lot of what I was doing. Um, and to get to support students as close to individually as possible, you know, in an event like this. And if any of you reach out to me afterwards, which you should absolutely feel free to do, I'd love to hear from you. Um, but also organizing programming at the MLA convention and coming up with resources that will hopefully be evergreen to help students and departments think through the different ways that they can do professional development um, is actually all stuff that I was really excited about. Um, I was, I, sh I guess I should say, um, I was on the tenure track uh, market uh, during the fall of the year that I was finishing. I had done this program through the MLA. It got me really interested in this kind of professional development work. Um, and what, that was in my penultimate year. And so I got to the fall and decided to apply for tenure track jobs because I thought I wanted to do that work as a faculty member. Um, and I think that there are parts of it that would have really worked for me. But like I said, there's a lot about being at a national organization and quite frankly, just having a nine to five um, and getting to stay in New York City where I was already living. That sounded really attractive. And so that, that's what informed a lot of my decision. And again, this is one job and I'm very happy at the MLA, but careers are long and, and and um, and are not linear. You know, I think anyone who you talk to, who you do informational interviews with, or if you talk to Rajni or Justin, it's important to think of this stuff as circular and iterative and not as a sort of linear pathway that's always gonna go in the same direction. And so once, I, once you have that first job after your degree, that's gonna give you a whole other set of experiences and skills that you can then articulate in different ways and pivot into other things. Again, depending on what you might be interested in or, you know, life changes. You you meet someone and you move to a different city with them, or or you want some more structure, or you want less structure, or you can you can do all these things over and over. You can go back to imagine PhD and reassess. Um, so don't feel like you're making a decision forever. Um, last question, uh, one, one of the last few questions submitted was, what qualities do humanities students lack? And I'd say, and I'd, I'll add, if any, compared generally to competitors from the social sciences? Um, I guess one of them would be, sometimes folks talk about um, quantitative skills uh, and the sort of technological competencies that often come along with them. Um, though I wouldn't necessarily say that that's always true um, because there might be ways in which humanities folks have developed those skills um, along the way or that they had from, from previous jobs. Um, and even, you know, it's sort of fun. I, I keep bringing up the ACLS Public Fellows Program, but there, there are jobs that look much more quote unquote social science-y um, that you'll see when they get announced. And then they announce 
the winners of the fellowships and you know someone in uh in english or french ended up with that job or um you know so i i think it really i think it really depends and um i just wouldn't feel comfortable generalizing too much and again before you start thinking about filling those lacks um i would i would do some thinking around like the kinds of opportunities that you think you might want to pursue um like you could think you, you could have this feeling oh I, I i don't really have quantitative research skills i'm going to need to develop some and take an excel course um but if you're mostly applying for jobs that are all qualitative research you know how much of that is actually going to be um super useful so again, before you go developing new skills, think about the ones you already have and what it is that you actually might need to pursue the kinds of roles and opportunities that you're actually interested in. Okay, we have a question from Justin and then Ashley's question. Yeah, I have a question. So when I talk to my colleagues and former students who did STEM PhDs and then transitioned to different careers, whether it's in policy or communication or consulting or industry, almost all of them still consider themselves scientists. They still identify with that, that part of their, that, that strong part of identity. I don't see that same thing when people, you know, finish a humanities PhD and go into consulting or finish a humanities PhD and go to these, some of these areas. Um, I guess sort of thinking about both your own personal journey and also your work at the MLA, are there things that you would recommend people to, to maintain that aspect of their identity, even if they do a career pivot? You know, ways they can stay involved in the MLA, way, opportunities to maintain that, that literary, that humanistic side of themselves, even if they are going into a more technical field or something that seems fairly removed from what they studied to do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in terms of staying involved with the MLA, um, we have a fair amount at uh, the annual convention. We're also thinking about more and more ways to connect people and to serve more meaningfully folks who go beyond the professoriate. Um, and so if you have ideas or things that you'd like to see in that regard, it's part of my job, so please get in touch. Um, bit of a shameless plug. Um, but in general, um, I don't know, I think, I think Networks are a big thing, you know, I think that, that that's an icky word for a lot of people, but really all it is is just building and maintaining relationships and community. And so I think whether it's through a professional national association like the MLA or just through folks you met in graduate school or connecting with others. Um, I've made some really wonderful new friendships, even just this past convention in January, folks that I've stayed in touch with all through the quarantine have been kind of kicking around these broader questions of um, the value of the humanities, especially in a moment like this. So I think the different ways in which you can meet people in person, um, but also digitally, you know, LinkedIn is an incredibly powerful tool. And, and like I said, Twitter, I've, I've learned so much just following certain kinds of conversations and DMing someone and saying, hey, I saw, you know, this is on your mind or, you know, I really appreciated what you said about X can just be a way to, um, to connect with folks. Um, and in terms of cultivating those habits of mind, at a more personal level, you know, I continue to read and expand my horizons. It's nice to, um, it's nice to read books that I find uh, interesting that are part of my intellectual side, but that aren't, you know, necessarily part of my research, right? Like I can, I can cultivate that side of things. Um, but like I said, a lot of the ways in which I understand um, inter interpersonal and institutional dynamics between faculty, different parts of the university, students, national associations, culture change. Um, a lot of that is because of the experience I had as a graduate student. But a lot of that is, you know, I, I wrote a dissertation about popular opinion in the media and thinking about the ways in which um, people change their minds and, and what legal power looks like and what institutions say and what soft power looks like. Um, and so it's kind of fun to grapple with those on, in a more professional context every day. And so I think it's sort of, um, in a more humanistic sense up to us to kind of think about the ways in which that training and it's sort of nice to have that to have those moments they sort of come up by surprise and it's like oh you know this isn't so far from those broader theoretical questions i was interested in when i was writing this project so i think leaving room for it to surprise you too is is nice cool thank you Brian, we'll just wrap up with one last question because a lot of people on this call, I recognize the names and I, I know what phase of, uh, of job search they're in right now. They have a question. 
Do you have any particular strategies since you just did it 15 months ago for searching for job opportunities um, that you can recommend? And you know, some things that we say are look on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the other uh, ways in which you can search for job opportunities? Yeah, I think um, LinkedIn and Twitter are, uh, like I said, especially powerful tools. Um, I think uh, Inside Higher Ed, that job board can have some interesting stuff. Um, I think um, ACLS Public Fellows, again, going back to um, going back through old jobs and not only getting a sense of like, oh, Minnesota Public Radio or oh, the Council of State Legislatures. These are the kinds of places that might, hi these are places that have hired, um, but also getting a sense from there of the kinds of places that hire PhDs. And also to the question before about entry level roles. Um, what can I expect? You know, what kind of job, at what level can I expect to be hired? What are the kinds of things that might be my responsibilities? I think re actually reading through the job ads, um, and I can share some resources that the MLA has um, that will also make up for my um, cranky graphics that I couldn't show. Um, doing some practice around that can help give you a sense of the kinds of jobs that, the level that you might expect to be hired at. Um, and yeah, Glassdoor as well. Um, but yeah, I think that gives you a good sense of the landscape and also, again, you know, will it be entry level or, or, or can I expect a little bit more? Well, Brian, thank you. We usually try to end on time because I see people leaving uh, off the call when, when, it, when it's close to one o'clock. So thank you for sharing. If you if you want, I can share the graphic that you wanted to send. You can just email it to me and I'll email it to everyone on this call so everyone has it. That would be great. Okay, and I'll also send you the recording so you can have it as well. Wonderful, yeah. And um, if you could just encourage everyone, for everyone who's still here now, but in your message, um, I'm really happy. I love to be in touch. So if anybody has follow-up questions or just wants to connect, yeah. please reach out. Yeah, I'll share your LinkedIn profile so they can reach out and your Twitter handle as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks to everyone for joining the call and I'll email you all later. Great. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Brian. Thanks. Thanks, Brian.